let's talk about let's talk about BDD with Cucumber. I'm Ryan Marsh, and uh, I help companies with uh, development and BDD. So the title of the talk is BDD uh, with Cucumber. BDD stands for Behavior Driven Development. Uh, who knows or is familiar with Behavior Driven Development? Okay, good, good. Who has used Cucumber? Okay. Out of the developers who have used Cucumber, how many would say that you enjoyed it? OK, good. I'm glad you guys are honest. So why would I be talking to a room full of developers about a tool that less than half of them like to use right before lunch? <laughs> OK, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that. OK, so, so uh, w first, what is behavior-driven development? Well, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I help a lot of companies and a lot of teams with this, and I have no idea what these words mean. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to try to explain this to you how how I explain it to teams. So, behavior-driven development is a process for the team where the team collaborates to produce a natural language description of the behavior of the software. We connect that natural language description to automated tests to produce living documentation. It's that simple. It's a team process. It's not, it's not just something for developers. It's a team process where we collaborate to develop natural language uh, descriptions of the software, connect them to automated tests to produce living documentation. And when I say natural language, I should put an asterisk there. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so if you're a React developer, it's, uh, you probably would rather interpret it like this. Uh, living documentation is a higher order component of connecting map test to behavior. OK, React, my React developers? <laughs> All right. So um, there's a bunch of smart people in the room. If you want to go look at it, cucumber.io or github.com slash cucumber slash cucumber.js. I'm going to just take you quickly through it, because this is a lightning talk. Uh, but uh, please don't use that time right now to dig through the code. Just give me a few minutes, OK? Um, so I'm not going to show you exactly how to use it. Like I'm not going like, to do a code demo up here, because all the smart people in here can go, can go do that. I want to give you more of a conceptual understanding of it and, and then walk you through the core problem of why less than, uh, less than half the room didn't like to use it. OK, so natural language description. In Cucumber, we start off with something called a feature file. The feature file starts out with feature colon, and it has a title. This is the beginning of our natural language description of the software. There is some structure to this. Uh, English is a uh, context-sensitive language. And for, in order for a parser to interpret it, it ha we have to put it into some sort of a context-free grammar. right? So we do apply some structure to it, but it's natural language. So we have a feature, borrow or age limitation, uh, some, a description that can be anything that's not parsed. And then we have something called a scenario. So we have a scenario. The scenario has a title. We also call these examples. You can use the keyword example there. So that's a title. And then we have this keyword given in this sentence and an and. So the given means something. It's yellow. That's got to mean something, right? Uh, given a standard 30-year fixed mortgage, and the borrower's date of birth is blah, 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 and the loan date is blah, blah, blah. We're setting something up here. We're setting up the world. This is context. You'll be tested on this later. Uh, next up, there's a when. That's yellow, too. That probably means something. When the loan is submitted to underwriting. The when is our action. We have context. We have action. What's next? An outcome. Then we should see an error. The then matters. Given, when, and then. These are important keywords. Uh, for everybody who in the since everybody in the room has read Kent Beck's test driven development book, you'll recognize the given when and then because they correspond uh, the context action and outcome because they correspond with arrange act assert. And I know everybody's read that book here. Okay, great. So uh, so what does the code look like? We said we were going to take this natural language description and we're going to connect it to tests, right? Okay, let's connect it to tests. So we're going to start out and we're going to import given when and then from Cucumber. Some other stuff to just help our test run, expectations, maybe some fixtures, our app code. And then we have a function called given. We're passing it a string and a function. A string and a function, that's the method signature. And this function name is given, OK? So what's going to be in there? Oh, so we're going we're gonna, to, maybe we have a, a data structure that has what a 30-year fixed mortgage is. And we're going to pull that up, and we're going to set it to this.loan. 
Now we have, we had some, an, some ands, if you remember. Those ands could be setting the date of birth, setting the, the date on the loan. We have a when. The loan is submitted to underwriting, so it matches a string and a function, again. And there's our then. Again, it takes a string and a function, and if you look closely, the function takes message, which was extracted out of the then. I don't know if you remember back there, but there was a string at the bottom of our uh, outcome. So you can use regular expressions here, or you can use uh, some much simpler string expressions that we've created, uh, whatever you need what, uh, to, to meet your needs there. Like, uh, regular expressions can be very powerful, but they're off-putting to some people, um, mainly noobs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to be inclusive. OK, so let's talk about how this all works. So you have a feature file. I showed you that. That's our natural language description. Uh, over here on the right, we have our step definitions. That was the code. That's our test code. We call that step definitions. We have steps in the feature file. That's our given, when, and then. Step definitions in our JavaScript code over there. OK, so what happens? The feature file gets parsed and turned into an abstract, abstract syntax tree, uh, which in memory looks like this. <laughs> the step definitions get run, and they basically produce, uh, if you could think of it as like a hash or a table in memory where we have the regular expressions or those strings and then their corresponding functions. So like a table of those, you could imagine. And so then as we go to execute those, we walk the AST. So we find the first step, the first given. We look through the table to find a matching string or a matching regex. If we find that more than one match well, we throw an error, ambiguous step definition. If we don't find one that matches, we throw an error, missing step definition. So we found the, right, we found the matching function. Uh, we found the matching regex and the corresponding function, so we're going to run that, that step of the test's pass. We'll go ahead and we'll do that for the remaining steps as we walk the AST, call the corresponding function, and if it doesn't throw an error, it passes, just like in Jest. Again, doesn't throw an error, it passes. Oopsies, we have a failing test. Okay. So a lot of questions now come about. I have tests. I've got them in my favorite test framework. I love Jest. Why do I need to put my tests in something else? Um, who writes this documentation, right? Uh, these are the questions that I get asked next. And I'm sorry to tell you that some tests will have to be in two places, and we have to write docs. This is uh, what developers love to hear. Um, OK. so. The reason for that, and what I really want to talk to you about today, and the reason that teams sort of struggle to adopt this well, and some developers don't enjoy doing this, is because uh, we miss the fundamental reason why we're trying to create living documentation by taking natural language descriptions of the behavior of the software and connecting them to tests. And that is complexity in communication. So complexity in communication, um, communication is basically the number one thing when I talk to teams the number one thing that they mention in terms of the success of a project, they always say, like, oh, we had good communication. Or the failure of a project, there was no good communication, the communication was bad, right? These, these are two contributing factors. They, they, uh, they always get mentioned. But what's interesting about that is communication is not that hard. Does anybody not understand what I'm saying right now? <laughs> so what's the problem? Why do we struggle with communication? on a project, the reason is that we're communicating about complex systems with a brain that was selected for avoiding predators, poking things with a stick, and telling stories around a campfire. That's the problem. And if you look at every problem in software development as a team, and you start there, things start to make more sense. Things start to become obvious, OK? So we must reduce precision in order to make meaningful statements about complex systems. We must reduce precision in order to make meaningful statements about complex systems. I'd love to say that that quote's for me, but I actually stole it from a guy who stole it from a guy. He stole it from, from his computer science professor. OK. So let me sort of illustrate this for you. On the left here, we have this cloudy amorphous idea, this idea guy, or the sales, the sales, sales guy. Sales guy walks in a room. Customers want this, right? And 
Over there on the right is our dev, and he's like, man, I'm just trying to put bits on CPU registers right now, man. Like, okay, and like, how hard is this? How hard is it to bridge that gap? Well, I mean, can you imagine what it was like to work on the IBM 360 project, right? Well, that's what it was like. That's a book about the IBM 360 project, Banana for Scale. The <laughs> They had a lot to say about it. It's a really good book. You should read it. I haven't read it, but I heard it's good. <laughs> so ideas, we've got to cross this chasm of bits on CPU registers. Well, I'll tell you what would help. It would help if we could use a standard instruction set. So we put some microcode in the CPU, and then it'd be nice. Now we can write assembly. OK, that's great. That helps. I'm a little bit closer to the idea guy. Let's add on GCC. I'd like to program in C. GCC is about, uh, it weighs in at 14 and a half million lines of code. Now I can write C. Uh, it'd be really nice if I had an operating system that could abstract the hardware for me. There we go, Linux, 21 million lines of code. Um, we're getting closer, guys. Um, what's up next? Yeah, no, so V8 is 2 million lines of code, and I threw, I'm, I'm not being scientific here, but I threw an extra little bit in for, for, for Node itself. It's, I'm guessing maybe another million lines. Um, okay, and then, so uh, I want to be able to make my apps visual, right? The idea guy, he's got big ideas, right? They need a big canvas. They need the web. What am I going to do? Create React app. Anybody want to guess how many lines of codes that is? Dependencies and all. 1,070,841 lines of code I checked last night. OK, so now our developer, he's a lot closer to the idea guy, to the sales guy with his wonderful, grandiose idea. I think, it's real, I think it's time for the idea guy to help, don't you? OK, so let's see what he can bring to the table. <laughs> Not helping. Not helping. He's got pictures and words. And I, and, and I mean, I just figured, like, if a picture's worth a 1,000 words and he does a 1,000 pictures, he would have a million words. OK, all right, we'll give him that. So, 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 so what's going on here? Um, now our idea guy is a little bit closer. But we have this no man's land between us. How do we, how do we bridge this no man's land? Like, how do, we, how do we cross this chasm between all of us? This is where the communication happens. This is the communication about complex systems. This is the core of the problem on the team. And quite frankly, that's how we make our money, right? Because we get a guy, he's now considered a product guy. I'm now considered a React guy, right? And so, and so we've specialized the, in these ways of translating our communication amongst each other. I've specialized in translating product ideas into React. This fellow's um, specialized in translating things into pictures and words. Um, OK, so what can we use to help us cross this gap? There's got to be something else. There's got to be a way that we can communicate about complex systems there's got to be a way that we can communicate about complex systems that makes a difference, right? that really, really helps us. This is something that we know about. State, action, new state. Where does, where, where does this come from? I mean, recently, where does this come from? Redux. That's right, Redux. Yeah. So we have, just think about this experimentally. Imagine you're dealing with a complex system from the outside, a biological system, let's say. We have the system is in a particular state. We introduce a stimuli. We observe a phenomenological response or new state. That is how we interact with complexity in a predictable manner. That's what makes time travel, uh, time travel debugging so awesome, right? It's because I went to this state. I introduced this stimuli to the system. I'm now at this state. What if we could talk about in this language with everybody on the team? What if we thought about? everything in terms of context, action, and outcome. Starting with a state, we introduce an action, we expect an outcome. So let's take this back to our Cucumber example here, our feature file. The context, that's the original state. We have a standard 30-year fixed mortgage, the borrower's date of birth, and a loan date. These are specific hard-coded examples. These are specific concrete examples. We have an action that introduces a stimuli or a change or a mutation to the system we, by submitting it to underwriting. And we observe an outcome, right? So uh, this is a lightning talk. 
Um, if you want to learn more about this, we at Cucumber have a BDD Kickstart. It's a two-day class that gets everybody on your team up and running doing this together. We talk about a lot more stuff, like rules and examples. So not just examples, but rules and examples and how they tie together. Um, if you want to know more about Cucumber, cucumber.io or github.com slash cucumber slash cucumber.js. Um, you can email me there about uh, the BDD Kickstart class. And um, uh, Jason Langford, the first talker, said that uh, you should hire external trainers. I'm a freelance external trainer. You should hire me. Um, thank you very much.